Hello everyone, my name is Ian, you're watching Big Rock Moto. Thanks so much for tuning in today for another video. It seems like almost every video out there about this bike, the Suzuki Hayabusa, focuses just on outright speed. But there's a lot more to the Hayabusa story than just speed, and that's the story I want to help try to tell you today. This is the full review of the Gen 3 Hayabusa, and here's how I'm going to break down this video. Now, if you're looking for just more of a vlog style video where I go out and ride the bike the whole time, I did that a week or two ago, and I'll post that link down below. So in today's video, we're going to cover all the details of this bike and really go in depth. So here's how I'm going to break this down. First, we're going to go through a brief history lesson of the Hayabusa, just very brief, I promise. Then we're going to talk about the specs and features of the Gen 3 bike. We're going to talk about the generational changes between Gen 1, 2, and Gen 3 Hayabusa. I'll give you a tour of the bike and all its features. Then we'll talk about the main competition to this bike. Then we'll answer your questions that you've all sent in, and then we'll have some final thoughts. So with that out of the way, let's go ahead and get started with the review. So let's take a look at the brief history of the Hayabusa, since it's so important to telling the story of this bike. So in the late 90s, Suzuki decided to get into competition with bikes like Honda Super Blackbird, which at the time was the fastest road legal production motorcycle. And they decided to launch this, the Hayabusa GSX 1300R. When this bike came out, they were able to claim, at least for a while, that it was the fastest bike in the world. And early bikes went around 195 miles an hour, although reports vary on that. Now, soon after that, a lot of the manufacturers got together and entered into something called a gentleman's agreement where they said, we're gonna limit the bikes to 300 kilometers per hour or 186 miles per hour electronically because they were worried about governments cracking down with regulations if they had these bikes going over 200 miles an hour. So they were just worried about it and they decided to put some regulations in place on themselves. Now, Suzuki, in order to make a bike that could sustain these high speeds, and reach these high speeds, they had to do a lot with the aerodynamics. So if you look at the styling of the Hayabusa's, it's always been criticized, but the reason the styling is the way it is is because of aerodynamics. The bike is designed with aerodynamics in mind to travel with the rider at very, very high sustained speeds. The Gen 1 Hayabusa was powered by a 1299cc inline four-cylinder engine, but it had ram air ducts, which were at the front of the bike and fed air at high speeds into the air box to achieve 173 horsepower, which was a very, very high number at the time. Hayabusa is Japanese for a peregrine falcon. Now, a peregrine falcon is a bird that can dive at over 200 miles an hour, and it's also been known to eat blackbirds. So you see what Suzuki did there with the name. It was very funny, very creative, and very good job. When Suzuki brought out the Hayabusa 99, it became an instant legend. And the reason was that it was extremely fast, but it was also extremely dependable. You could tune it, you could customize it, and it built up a cult following and a real big community started to build up around this bike. Beyond just going really fast, people also realized that the Hayabusa was very, very smooth and somewhat comfortable or relatively comfortable compared to like a pure uh, sport bike or track bike. And it was extremely reliable as well with many riders racking up many, many miles without any issues at all. So over the years, Suzuki has really wanted to remain true to the roots of the original Hayabusa. They have redone the bike in 2008, which was the Gen 2. And then again in 2021, which is this bike here, the Gen 3 Hayabusa. For 2022, at least here in the USA, the Hayabusa only comes in one trim level, and it'll set you back $18,600 plus freight and other fees that dealerships always hit you with. That's a pretty significant price jump from the Gen 2, but we'll talk about pricing here in a minute. And when you factor in inflation on the older bikes, actually this is not as quite as bad as it seems. Now we have to cover the literal elephant in the room, which is not the GSA behind me here, but it's the weight of the Hayabusa. So it's kind of interesting to note that if you look behind me there, there's my GSA 1250. This bike is almost as heavy as that 1250 GSA. So the Hayabusa comes in at 583 pounds or 264 kilograms um, wet, ready to ride with all its gas and all its fluids. The Gen 3 Hayabusa uses a 1340cc inline four-cylinder engine with a pretty stout 12.5 to 1 compression ratio, making about 188 horsepower or 138 kilowatts and a whopping 110 foot-pounds or 149 newton meters of torque. That's a lot of torque. The bike uses a six-speed gearbox with an adjustable quick shifter and also a slipper clutch. The bike has a 31.5 or 800 millimeter seat height and it carries 5.3 gallons of gas. The Hayabusa for the third generation, at least in the US, comes in four different colors. You can have the black and gold like this bike here. You can have one in silver and red, or they'll do you one with white and blue, which I think looks particularly nice. 
The Gen 3 Busa also comes with a full suite of electronics, which we'll talk about in a video in a few minutes, but everything from 10 level traction control to lift control, otherwise known as wheelie control, uh, ABS, obviously, cornering ABS. Um, it has a speed limiter to limit your speed when you're accelerating. It has cruise control. We'll cover all that, but it's a very, very comprehensive and very, very well thought out set of electronic controls that increase the safety factor of riding this bike. So let's talk a little bit about how this Gen 3 Busa differentiates itself from the Gen 2 and the Gen 1 bike. So we'll just cover this briefly so we don't make this video go on forever. Now, while there were smaller tweaks within each generation of Hayabusa, like changes to the frame and changes to the brakes, you can look up those details if you really need to. But for our purposes, the Hayabusa really breaks down into three generations. Gen 1 was 1999 to 2007. Gen 2 was 2008 to 2018, where they stopped production. And then a Gen 3 came out for 2021. The first generation Hayabusa used a 1,299cc engine with an 11.1 to 1 compression ratio, and it made 173 horsepower or 129 kilowatts and 102 foot pounds or 138 newton meters of torque. Wet weight came in around 560 pounds ready to ride. The price in the US at the time was 10,499. Now in today's dollars, I did the adjustment for that and that would come out to $17,400 in today's dollars. So that's kind of interesting, isn't it? So in 2008, Suzuki revamped the bike and the Gen 2 Hayabusa in 2008 had a larger engine. They bumped it up to 1,340cc with a compression ratio bump of going up to 12.5 to 1. It made 194 horsepower or 145 kilowatts and 113 foot-pounds or 113 newton meters of torque. So if you just want to look at which Hayabusa made the most power out of the factory, it was the Gen 2 bike. But there's more to the story and we'll get to that in a minute. The Gen 2 Busa gained a little bit of weight, but not too much, and it came in at 580 pounds wet. Just about everything was revised for the second generation bike, including the brakes, the suspension, the cooling systems, and a lot more. The price in the US in 2008 was 14,699, or if you adjust to today's dollars, 2021 dollars, that would have been $18,884. So for all the people saying that this bike, the Gen 3 Busa, is so, so expensive, Actually adjusted for inflation, it's a little bit less than the Gen 2 bike when it came out. So this bike here, the Gen 3 Hayabusa, despite keeping true to Suzuki's roots of reliability and speed and acceleration and the sleek looks, they revamped the entire bike and made comprehensive changes. While it shares the same displacement as the previous engine, the engine has been heavily reworked. And I'm not gonna go into all the details of that. You can look those things up if you want, but the engine is very, very different from the one in the Gen 2, although some of the basic things are the same and the displacement remains the same. It's kind of received the same treatment that a lot of motorcycles have when they have to homologate to Euro 5 uh, compliance, which for those of us here in the US is just an emissions thing they have over in Europe. When they have to meet that Euro 5, what they tend to do is they give the bike more exhaust, like larger exhaust. And sometimes you get a little bit of bump in torque, but sometimes a slight reduction in peak horsepower. So the horsepower and torque curves can change a little bit. And in the case of the Gen 3, and I'll put up a video here that Suzuki brought out of some of the bikes drag racing, the Gen 3 is actually faster in the real world, even though it has slightly less power and torque on paper. So the price of the Gen 3, like we mentioned at the start, has gone up to around $18,600. But again, if you adjust for inflation, that's really not too bad if you look at the prices of the older Hayabusas. This thing is fast. So let's start the tour of the bike by just kind of jumping on and showing you the riding position. So the, one of the first things you're going to notice when getting on the Hayabusa is that it's not that too high off the ground. It's around a 31 and a half inch seat height. So I can definitely flat foot, but it's very, very heavy. Um, once you lean it over about uh, this much, it starts to feel like it wants to tip over. 
trying to move it and push it around is pretty intimidating. And if you're a shorter person or a lighter person or maybe not that strong, um, it's a very difficult bike to maneuver. And pushing it around by hand, not sitting on it, is even harder. So let me show you the riding position. I kind of have to put the bike on the kickstand to do this. But you can see the riding position here is pretty aggressive. This is not what I would call a comfortable riding position. <laughs> Although if you're used to something super, super aggressive, this may not be too bad. But you're pretty leaned over. Um, the, you, you know, you can scoot back here and get down underneath the windshield here to get out of the wind. Um, you can see that, you know, you would be able to sort of rest a little bit like this and get into a more upright position, but uh, the bend of your knees and the way you're bent into the bike is pretty aggressive. Okay, so looking at the right side of the motorcycle here, some of the things that stand out are the Hayabusa logo, which is um, very beautifully put onto the fairing here. I really like this styling accent. Some people say chrome is kind of old school, but I think it really works against the black body work. And I like these gold accents. You've got like a, some sort of a vent that comes out here to vent the um, engine heat from the radiators. Large side fairings. You can see the mirrors here, which you can fold in. Moving around to the middle, you've got kind of this textured panel here. Uh, you've got the sides of the gas tank. Then you've got these large peg feelers on the foot pegs, traditional brake lever. You've got kind of a guard over the rear master cylinder. Then you've got more paintwork here. Then you've got the rear passenger pegs here, pretty high up. And you've got these very large exhaust canisters. So looking at the front of the motorcycle, you've got LED high beams for high and low. I've got the turn signals activated. I really like how the turn signals are integrated into the bodywork. They do this for styling, but also for aerodynamic reasons, so they're not sticking out into the air. You've got these folding mirrors here, which are nice if you're storing a bike in your garage or transporting it. Then you've got these ram air ducts here in the front, which suck air in, which look really cool and really aggressive. You've got this big aggressive front fender, big wide front tire, and of course you've got these big beautiful brakes with the Brembo Stylema calipers on them. So let's knock out the left side and the back all in one segment here. So there's not much different on the left side than the right side, except of course you've got an adjustable shift lever here, which you have this turnbuckle style adjustment, which is easy to adjust. You've got a kickstand, which works just as you would expect. And that's about it. Now the seat release is right here, which you can't see when you're standing up. So you actually kind of have to bend down and you can eventually, you'll get used to where this is, but it's right here under this rear cowling. Now coming around to the back, on this bike, I do have the passenger seat installed and it has this rear grab handle, which is kind of awkward to use. Um, I don't think it'd be very good for the passenger. It's also very awkward to use when you're moving the bike around. I would have liked to see some sort of a grab helmet here on the side, but again, I'm used to adventure bikes, so I guess I'm just spoiled with that. Now on the back, of course you notice license plate fender, license plate light, um, big LED tail lights, and the turn signals are integrated into the tail light housing, which I think looks very sleek. You don't have stupid looking turn signals coming out the side. And yeah, that's about it, other than of course the huge exhaust canisters, which are a necessary evil for Euro 5 emissions requirements. Okay, I wanna give you a tour of sort of the instruments and the handlebars. Now this is a very difficult kind of shot for me to get, so I apologize, my head is gonna kind of be going in and out of the shot here. But what I want you to focus on is the instrumentation and the handlebars. So let's look at the handlebars, okay? Starting here on the left, you've got the cruise control switch and the mode switch, turn signal and the horn. Uh, moving around to the, you've also got the high and low beam switch up here. Moving around here to the center, you've got this kind of blade style key here, which I think is really nice. You've got your fork adjustments here in the top. Um, the gauge cluster, I think, is one of the best features of this whole bike. It's beautiful with these kind of raised indentations. It looks like a nice, like, expensive watch. Um, the gold rings here, so you've got a fuel gauge over here. You've got the temperature gauge here. You've got a nice big analog tachometer and a nice big analog speedo as well. Then, of course, in the middle, you've got this multifunction TFT, which is really crisp and really clear, even though it's maybe slightly small. But this is where you're going to control all your electronics. It also gives you your trip computers, your miles per gallon, stuff like that, a clock, air temperature, and different functions like that. And you've got some indicator lights like ABS, traction control, different, different um, neutral lights and things like that here in the middle. 
So let's talk briefly about the electronics on the new Hayabusa. It comes with an amazing array of electronics really aimed at a smoother, safer, and more customizable riding experience. So it's all linked to Suzuki's six-axis IMU, or inertial measurement unit, which senses all the forces acting on the bike. The bike has three preset riding modes, A, B, and C. A being aggressive, B being like a road mode, and C being like a rain mode, and it actually limits your power output. You also have programmable user modes, which you can customize to your liking. The parameters you have control over are the following. Lean sensitive traction control with 10 levels. Wheel lift control with 10 levels, that's wheelie control. Throttle response is three levels. And engine braking control, you have three levels. The bike also has three levels of launch control. It has cruise control, hill hold assist. It has a speed limiter, and it also has an up-down quick shifter with two different sensitivity settings. So suffice to say, the electronics on this new Busa are comprehensive, they work well. The way that Suzuki's integrated them into the handlebars without having too many switches, I think is a home run, the way it's all executed, and the dashboard looks beautiful. You just don't have a sense of how fast you're going with this bike. So how it handles corners, you know, it feels super, it feels very compliant. It doesn't feel like rough or bouncy. The suspension is very good quality and it's fully adjustable. It feels um, easy to ride. Uh, the power, again, if you keep the power below like four or 5,000, it's uh, very smooth and controllable. We need to talk about what competition does the Hayabusa face. So some other content creators and other journalists, if you may have noticed some of this out there, they've pointed out correctly that there are motorcycles with better power to weight ratios that are faster than the Hayabusa in terms of outright acceleration, especially between like maybe zero and 120 or zero and 150 in those ranges. The Hayabusa still punches very heavy at those higher speeds because it's so aerodynamic. But if you're simply just looking for the most lightweight and most powerful motorcycle that will get you to 100 miles an hour or 120 miles an hour in the absolute fastest time, yeah, there are other choices and the Hayabusa may not quite have the same advantage that it used to. So other journalists and other creators have made a lot of sort of noise about this fact. And while it is true, I think what they're missing is the rest of the story of the Hayabusa. For instance, what about the fact that this bike has 110 foot pounds of torque? What about the fact that it is dead solid reliable over all the years since it's been coming out and all the different generations? What about the fact that the bike has an amazing rider community, the forums, the support groups, the clubs, the meetups, the customization. This bike has a whole culture and a whole community built around it, which is not something you can say about most motorcycles. So sure, if you just want to go as absolutely as fast as you can and you don't care about the budget, you don't care about practicality or comfort or reliability or any of that, you know, you could get a Ducati Panigale V4 with like 215 horsepower and it weighs like 440 pounds and you can send yourself to Jupiter on that thing, that's, that's fine. But let's talk about some of the more direct competition to the Hayabusa. So Kawasaki still sells the ZX14R. And that bike is about $3,000 less than this bike. It makes a lot of power. It's kind of in the same size and weight class, uh, but you've got the good value there. So that might be something you wanna look at. Although that bike is getting pretty dated in terms of its technology compared to the new Busa. Now, some people want to compare this bike to sport touring bikes like an FJR 1300 or a 1250RT from BMW or Concourse 14. Well, the fact is the Hayabusa is a lot faster than those bikes. It's more um, acceleration oriented, more high speed oriented, more performance oriented, and it's a much more aggressive riding position. It's not nearly as comfortable as those sport touring bikes. It places much more emphasis on high speed and acceleration. So you're just going to have to pick what compromise you want there. Now, if you have the budget, Kawasaki's H2 line of supercharged 1,000cc four-cylinder bikes, they start around $25,000 and go up pretty quickly from there. So that's a very expensive line of bikes to buy into. I was on Kawasaki's website looking at a model they call the H2SX SE, and it's around $26,000. It's a little bit more touring oriented, a little bit more upright than this bike. And it has some pretty incredible features in addition to the supercharged engine, which makes a ton of power. 
uh, but it has things like uh, Skyhook adaptive electronic suspension. It has adaptive cruise control. That thing is absolutely loaded to the gills with modern tech. So if you have a lot of money uh, and you, you have some choices, then maybe that's something you want to look at. So a few weeks ago, I asked all of you to send in your questions about the Gentry Hayabusa, and a lot of you wrote in via email, social media, whatever, with questions. So I've taken note of them here, and I'm going to go through all the best ones I received. So let's just go ahead and get started. Um, Ryan Brown asks, my question is why? If you want a sport tour, there's much better options for the money. If you want a sport bike, there's better sport bikes for the money. I don't understand this at the price it's at. Thank you for all the work you do. Uh, well, thanks, Ryan. That's a good question. And I've, I've kind of touched on that in the rest of this video. Um, but I basically think you're right. I think it takes a very special person who wants the Hayabusa. Maybe they've had them before. Maybe they're part of that community. They'd like the looks of the bike, uh, certain aspects of the performance, the quality, the durability. And talking about the price, like I mentioned with the inflation, I don't think the price is too bad. Uh, but you're right. If you want like a sport touring with capital T on touring, then get something more comfortable, right? And if you want a pure sport bike, then you have that. But this is kind of its own thing. So Scott Silvers writes in and says, when do you predict you losing your license? Days, weeks, or months? So um, none of those options. I would say minutes to hours uh, from now, I will lose my license riding this bike. Boo Dog says, if you drop it, would it cost a fortune to fix it? Yes, it will, because all of these side fairings and plastics are going to be expensive. Um, so if you drop it and crack a bunch of these things, yeah, you're going to have a pretty big bill. And insurance on fully fared bikes tend, tends to be higher because of that. Gman022004 says, is there anything else you could recommend with a little more power <laughs> for a confident beginner? Uh, something more power than a Hayabusa for a beginner rider. Uh, well, you could put a turbocharger on a Hayabusa. That'd be a good beginner bike. Uh, you could get the Kawasaki H2R. I think it's like uh, 200 and something horsepower. You could get that. Maybe that Ducati Panigale before I said. I mean, that should be pretty affordable. So yeah, there's a lot of good options there for a beginner. Jag Noor says, it's a super fast pig, but is it practical at all for daily living? Is it necessary versus like any halfway normal bike? Um, is it necessary? No. But is it amazing? Yes. So you just have to choose which one you want. Is it practical for daily living? Um, for me, no, not really, just because I'm not comfortable on this kind of bike leaned over, leaned over the tank like that. I prefer to ride upright bikes. Um, but a lot of people would find it practical for daily living. I mean, just keep in mind it's heavy. It's kind of hard to maneuver. Um, the steering lock doesn't go very far, so it, it has a very long turning radius. You'd have to put some sort of luggage on it, but yeah, you could use it every day. It's, it's pretty easy to ride as long as you keep the RPMs below about 4,000. Derek Bender says, how good of a tour is it? Um, I, I mean, I haven't tried touring with it, but I know there's a lot of people who do tour with these. They put on uh, bar risers, they put on maybe a tank bag to kind of lean against, maybe some side bags back here. And uh, I don't see why it wouldn't be great at touring if you did all that. I mean, the fairing is very effective at keeping the wind, wind uh, going around you. It's aerodynamic, you've got cruise control. Uh, it's got a pretty big gas tank. So yeah, you could totally tour on it as long as you'd be comfortable with it. So um, that's personal preference, whether you can deal with that leaned over position. Jonas Bain says, how do the brakes feel? How does the ABS perform? How does the front tire feel cornering suspension? These heavy bikes like the ZX-14 torture the front tire and brake is all that weight on the front end. Um, you're right about them torturing the front tire and the, and the front brakes. They do. They have pushed a lot of weight up towards the front. So sometimes the front tires can wear out um, even faster than the back tires in some cases. The brakes feel amazing. I, f I feel they're super strong. The ABS performs very well. It intervenes at just the right time. Uh, cornering and suspension feels very, very good. It feels very compliant, but it feels extremely planted and comfortable, but sporty at the same time. So I think they did a great job with the suspension and the brakes. RT says, how does it function as a daily commuter? How should someone fit this bike into their lineup? Uh, a daily commuter, I think there'd be a lot of better options. I don't think this is really something you'd look to for that, although you could. How should someone fit this into their lineup? Well, I think that it depends on your personal taste. If this is the kind of bike you like, then you're going to buy one. If it's not, then you're not going to buy one. If you're lucky enough to have a lot of different bikes, then it'd be a great to have to put in your collection because, you know, someday this, this kind of thing may not exist, right? So it'd be something cool to hang on to. 
Amari M says, is the seating position significantly more comfortable than a typical super bike? Um, I don't think so. I don't have a lot of experience on super bikes. He mentions the ZX-10R. I don't think it's significantly more comfortable, but a little bit. It's not quite as extreme as that, but it's still pretty aggressive. He also says it has 340cc more displacement, but is also much heavier than 1000cc sport bike. Is the big engine muted by the weight or does it still feel beastie in comparison? Uh, the weight does mute, I think, some of the lower speed acceleration, but I think in a good way. Everything feels velvety and damped and refined and kind of luxurious. It's smooth, it's torquey. So it's heavy, but it's still fast. Once you get the engine wound up, it's very, very fast. But, but yeah, it doesn't have the power to weight ratio of the lighter bikes. Moto Gus says, what should a riding background and associated skill level look like before riding one? Well, this is not for beginners, all jokes aside. I think you should have ridden some sport bikes, some sport touring bikes, definitely have some experience with bikes over 100 horsepower, know how to deal with high horsepower bikes. Um, you're gonna have to be used to that kind of leaned over riding position. So if you've only ever ridden a cruiser, this is gonna be pretty extreme for you. You're gonna have to be comfortable with heavier motorcycles. This is almost 600 pounds, so you really have to respect it. And you have to be very respectful of the power. Kay Dillon says, how does it compare in power and power delivery to bikes of different fields that may be used similarly, such as the R1250GS and the FJR1300? Well, um, this is very different. Um, the Hayabusa has a lot more power than any of those bikes. So on the top end of the RPM, it goes into complete insanity warp drive mode. And either you like that or it scares you or maybe both, but it's very different than those other bikes you mentioned. It's, um, you can ride it gently, but uh, you can feel there's a beast inside that wants to wake up and, and really run. I guess my answer is the power is there when you need it and when you don't need it, it's also smooth to ride at lower RPMs. Final thoughts on the third generation Suzuki Hayabusa. We spent a lot of time in this video talking about the technical aspects of the bike and its features and how it compares to other motorcycles out there. But truth be told, you really have to ride this bike for a while to start to understand it. And even though I've spent the last three or four weeks riding this bike, I'm still just scratching the surface of it. I can't realize its potential. I'm neither a good enough rider, nor do I have access to the kind of racetrack it would take to really realize just how fast this motorcycle can go. We live in a very interesting time where people are moving towards electric vehicles, lower emissions, lower carbon footprints. Governments around the world are tightening down regulations on all sorts of things. And I'm not saying that that's good or bad, but what I'm saying is that the world is changing and future generations of people, people younger than me, they may not have access to experiences like this. Being able to strap yourself on a bike like this that can reach 100 miles per hour in a few seconds and reach a top speed of almost 200 miles per hour, it's a moving, an emotional, and almost spiritual experience in terms of the adrenaline and the chemicals that it can activate in your brain. Uh, the experience of riding it and feeling the acceleration and being connected to the machine is not something that myself or I think anyone could really put into words. Suzuki has done an amazing thing with the Hayabusa ever since it came out and really creating a brand within a brand. And I think it's gonna stay that way for quite a long time to come. Despite not having owned or ridden the Gen 1 or the Gen 2 Hayabusa, I can confidently say that this is an amazingly well-executed motorcycle. It's smooth, it's fast, it's refined, the technology is amazing, the paintwork is amazing. Everything about it that I look at, that I touch, and the riding experience is premium, and I think that it is worthy of its price tag. I hope this review was informative, entertaining, and useful. And if you got value out of it, please subscribe, hit the bell, please leave a comment, hit the thumbs up, support me on Patreon, and consider buying my merchandise. But other than that, please ride safe out there. Thank you so much for coming along with me on this journey of growing this channel. I really appreciate you guys all being here. Um, put your questions and comments below. Otherwise, ride safe, and we'll see you out there. Let's send it into orbit. We're going to the moon, baby.